Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Short Form Adversity podcast. My name is Neos, and I'm going to be your host today. I'm very happy to have with me a good colleague and as well a very good friend, maybe also familiar to some of you. So I'm very happy to welcome Diana Loba. Hi, Diana. Hi, Neos. <laughs> nice to hear you again. again. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, for the ones, uh, for the new ones you're hearing, Diana is global product manager at Chat Pharma, and is responsible for the bulk vials. She leads and coordinates development for glass vials. So, as you may imagine, and as I like to mention here, she's our vial champion. Um, so you probably imagine if we talk with Diana and we talk about vials. So uh, this is going to be the topic of today. And to be more specific, title of today's session is Safe and Fast Drug Development, Choose the Right Vial from the Start. And talking about starting, Diana, are you ready? Yes. <laughs> so as your title say, um, choose the right vial from the start. Why is it so important? Yeah, so Neos, actually, it's like most of the times in life, prevention is simply better than cure, or you could also say better safe than, than sorry. So the thing is, what we often see is that pharma companies use a certain primary packaging container and everything is apparently fine at first. And then during development or even worse, after being marketed, maybe even years after being marketed, issues occur. And this then could lead to glass particles due to the lamination effects or, for example, a shift in pH due to an elevated leachable level. And from patient safety perspective, this is disastrous. I mean, there's a real threat of blocked vessels or adverse reactions. Okay, thanks. Sounds um, critical. Could you give an example of such a situation? Yes, yes, um, for sure. So definitely the most famous case um, is the one of Epigen in, in 2010. So this product, Epigen, has been in the market for roughly 10 years. And then suddenly certain vials showed particles. A big recall followed, retrieving all containers from the market. And in the end, only in 0.03% of the analyzed vials, glass particles have been found. But imagine the costs behind this action, the damage for the reputation and so on. So, but, but also already in, in early stages of development, our customers face unpleasant surprises, let's say. Yeah? So sometimes certain formulations are not stable in conventional life. Okay, I understand. Uh, definitely the severity in that specific case. And um, what was or what is the reason behind this phenomenon? So honestly speaking, I think that the inner container surface as the most relevant interaction partner for the drug formulation is simply not controlled enough. The only test required by pharmacopoeia for type 1 glass is the test for hydrolytic resistance. In my opinion, this test gives a good but often not sufficient indication for the suitability of the container. Okay, so mention here the the current test of the hydrolytic resistance, maybe to have everyone on the same page, what exactly is evaluated and done with this hydrolytic resistance test? Yeah, so basically, the idea is to assess the chemical stability of a glass container by its resistance to release soluble minerals into the water that is filled. Yeah, so to easily speak, um, it is tested how successful the filled water is by attacking the inner glass surface. And the most important pharmacopoeia tests are defined in USP 660 and EP 321 and easily explain the procedure is as follows. So the bulk container is cleaned first, kind of to, to mimic the washing process on, on bulk filling lines, and then purified water is filled in. And now, an important information, the amount of water filled in is 90% of the container's primful volume. Keep that in mind for later, please. Yeah? Then an autoclaving process follows. And afterwards, either by titration or by flame spectrometry, the amount of released alkali is measured. And here another important information. 
usually six randomly chosen vials undergo this test. For the measurement of the released alkali, the content of all these six vials is mixed together. This means that one very good and one bad vial or container in the end could end in an average good result. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for the explanation. So what I assume or guess is that <clears throat> this could mean that at the end of the test, the bad, so to say, container then pass a test and is used as a correct and a right one. Exactly. And, and now here it comes. In the end, it is a matter of process control, right? Of course, if the process is stable, there are no bad vials, no bad ones. And every vial would be the same have the same inner surface quality. But this is nothing I would rely on if I fill a drug that is worth hundreds or even thousands of euros per vial. This is something entirely incomprehensible for me, to be honest. Yeah, You invest millions, even billions of dollars in drug development, development and then put it at risk. And for me, you know, it's a bit like drinking an incredibly expensive red wine out of of a paper cup, you know? So, oh, okay, this gives me the chills. <laughs> yeah, as I know you can imagine. <laughs> um, oh, okay, but hearing you talking, so I suppose when you say that, it's because there's a solution, so this can be avoided somehow? Yeah, yes, so indeed there is, and of course, I do not deny that we want to sell our products, yeah, of course, yeah. But for this specific product, for me, it really is a matter of, of my, my deep conviction. Yeah, because it is simply difficult for me to understand why not simply choose the best type one class in a surface, especially for high value drugs or for diluents that are used for high value drugs, if there is a solution existing. And to say it in advance, in advance, yes, it has a higher price, this solution, but I can state that this is in a reasonable range and we are not talking about X times of a conventional vial. Okay, you're making this exciting. So, and the product would be, <laughs> I guess there's <laughs> the solution now coming. <laughs> yeah, so actually it is our every pure vial. Mm -hmm. Understand. So, to be honest, we've heard already about that. So this has been in the market quite a while, right, Diana? Yes, indeed. So we launched it in, in 2013. So actually it has its 10 years anniversary um, this year. And intentionally, this was developed as a solution against the lamination. But over time, we and also our customers realized its additional advantages. As answer to what I just mentioned above, a controlled inner surface, low leachables. So the best inner surface that you can get from a pure type 1 class. And today, we have more than 100 active articles, more than 40 customers buy it from small biotech, to the well-known big pharma customers. And most importantly, first customers started to have this vial as a basis, as a platform for their R&D activities. So meaning, when starting the evaluation of different formulations, every pure is the standard they start with. Of course, it might be the case that you need even more specialized vials, for example, when dealing with very high pH or with very sensitive molecules, then inner coatings might be needed. But Eric Pure is always their starting point. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, what exactly does controlled inner surface mean? Yeah, so back then, when this um, issue started with the delamination, what I just talked about in the beginning, the Epogen case, yeah, um, a lot of a lot of studies took place with regards to finding the origin um, for, for delamination. And it was found out that this origin for delamination lies in a zone just above the heel of the vial. And what happens is as follows. Yeah? So during the vial production process, you heat the glass tube. With that evaporates a cure that recondense on the nearest cooler region of the vial's interior surface, the mentioned heel zone. And this area is less chemically durable and more susceptible to the processes that lead to delamination. And what we have done to solve this is that we have established a patented process that avoids these condensates and leads to a homogeneous inner surface. Mm -hmm. 
And how do you or how can you control or how can you prove that? So in addition, we have developed a designated release test, the so-called quick test. What are we doing there? So first, the white is autoclaved, head down to mimic class attack. Yeah, so for four hours at 121 degrees Celsius, so very harsh procedure. And then the virus autoclaved, filled with purified water. And that is now the crucial point. Remember what I mentioned earlier during the hydrolytic resistance test, the vial is filled with 90% of brimful volume. Imagine you have a vial with a bad U zone. If filling with 90% of brimful volume, the effect is simply diluted. So you might have a very bad U zone, but a good rest of the inner surface. So you will never detect that this vial is actually bad. Yeah? And this is why for the specific release test of Eric Pure, each format is just filled in that way that the relevant heel zone is covered so that you really get the effect of that zone, that you can identify and extract the effect that this zone has with regards to, to legibles and yeah, with its, with its um, tendency towards elimination. Yeah? Then, and then we measure the amount of the released sodium. Yeah? And there again, for each format, a certified limit value exists. We are even able to produce files that are within the limit values of pharmacopoeia, yeah, so within the limit values of the hydrolytic resistance test, but out of our quick test specifications. And these are the critical outliers, the bad vials that can occur during conventional production. Okay, I think your last sentence was important. This is nothing that constantly happens, but um, what vials are produced, right? Yes, that is true. And it is what we call an outlier phenomenon. So only in rare cases, this weakened zone is produced. Yeah, but actually, that makes it even trickier. Like I mentioned above, with the currently installed control mechanism, the likelihood of detection is actually zero. And even if you perform screening studies, according to the recommendation chapter of USP 1660, it is only a snapshot. Yeah, It does not secure that the vials you will get and fill in the future will have the required inner surface. Think about the Epidurn case I mentioned in the beginning. This product um, has been in the market for 10 years without having issues. Okay, so could we say that it's kind of, instead of reacting then really risk mitigation approach? Yes, it is about reducing the risk to the most possible extent. And I mean, this is, uh, what you what you should do when it comes to patient safety, right? Uh, but of course, besides patient risk, there are also economical advantages of of this uh, kind of vial. I um, yeah, I assume the economical part is uh, of relevance too. Could you provide some examples? What would this be? Yeah, so I mean, Eric Pure is a vial with the reduced leachable level because the chemical less durable area in the heel zone does not exist. And that leads to the fact that the likelihood that a formulation is stable is much higher if you use such a vial than a conventional vial, meaning less risk for the stability of the protein or as well for the pH shift of the diluent, for example. Yeah? And during drug development, a lot of factors that influence drug stability cannot be foreseen or assessed from the start. I mean, this includes, for example, buffer systems, pH range, post-treatment, such as terminal sterilization, or the storage conditions. And with every pure, you choose a safe platform from the start that provides a broader range of formulation options. You avoid additional reformulation cycles if one formulation fails, and this results in a faster time to market. Mm -hmm. So actually, from a risk perspective and economic one, I understand, should be the product of choice. <laughs> exactly. And, and this is why I called my Pharmaversity presentation safe and fast drug development. Eric Pure contributes to both time to market as well as drug safety. And as I tried to express earlier, for me, to use this vial as a platform is a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. Right. Thanks, Ayana, for this interesting talk. Thanks to the audience for hearing. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.